And so, yep. Not quite oh, there. there. That's there. Hello. So, um, welcome to the Data Science Colloquium in the College of Arts and Sciences at Case Western Reserve University for 16 January 2020. It's 4 p.m. Eastern. Um, I'm Mark Turner, and I'm going to be talking about uh, big data science for multimodal communication. We have several people in here uh, through Zoom. This is being recorded. It will be posted. And we're going to experiment with having a remote presenter later on in the semester. We'll have a number of people who do um, remote presentations. So um, any scene of human communication uh, is just extremely rich in data. And almost any human scene is a scene of human communication. There are 7.7 .7 billion people on Earth now. That's an awful lot of data, and as long as, as far as we know, this has going, been going on for 50 or 60 or 70,000 years. The staggering amount of data to parse. And when you're dealing with grammar and forms of human communication, human, human beings using prosody, audio, material anchors, co-speech gesture, just everything for uh, communication, it's extremely complex. Now, for most of my life, I did what all linguists do, that is look at patterns of communication, uh, grammatical, morphological, whatever, and try to figure out how they work. It's very difficult to do. They're always immensely more complicated than speakers actually imagine. They're masters of communication, but they're almost oblivious to how they're actually doing that. This is usually a surprise to people. And the main method in linguistics has always been uh, the standard 800 pound gorilla in science, which is scientific generalization. You look at some data, you get an idea of how something works. So the linguist says, hey, double verb French analytic causatives work this way. It's immensely complicated. The clitics work this way. The reflexives work this way and so on. And you go looking for uh, disconfirming evidence. You look for cases that your theory does not cover. And it's highly empirical in the sense that the entire world is looking at such data and anybody can find a counterexample. An eight-year-old in the back of the room, very precocious eight-year-old, could say, no, linguist, you're wrong. Here's a, a tested expression that doesn't work the way you said it work. And then, of course, you adjust your ideas but that doesn't mean you have a model. It means you have a new hypothesis that you have to test against out of sample data. Otherwise, your model is just a restatement of the data. Now, there is no direct method for looking into the human mind and how it and minds and how they run communication. All of our methods are indirect. Um, the only thing that's happening now is some photons are striking your eye and some longitudinal waves are striking your ear, but you think that you know what I'm saying. How is your brain doing all that work in order to come up with these kinds of understandings out of these photons and longitudinal waves? Well, all of our methods are indirect, behavioral methods, uh, brain imaging, um, various kinds of elicitation, and so what you want in linguistics and the study of communication is lots of methods where they're all pointing to the same conclusion. Where you get unhappy is when the different methods are pointing to opposite conclusions, right? You want as many methods as, as you, you can possibly get. My idea of pseudoscience and the study of language and communication is to have just one method and to think you're going to run that one to the ground. Well, one that we uh, don't specialize in or haven't specialized in historically in philology, linguistics, language science is big data where you can test your hypothesis against vast amounts of ecologically valid uh, data. And I was always concerned about that. So in 2000, I was watching as genomics uh, realized they had the internet and decided that they were going to put all of the data 
in, in the cloud, essentially, and all of the tools as well. And immediately, this, it just erupted. I was at the Center for Advanced Study in the Behavioral Sciences at Stanford. Just erupted. I was watching as people in Australia would say, well, we've got this part. And people in Germany, well, we, we've got this part of the, of the genome. And if only we had a tool that could do this, somebody in Iowa would, would say. And somebody in Brazil would say, well, we've got a tool that can almost do this. Let's do a gaps. So, a, it was all in one place and everybody was working on it. And, and B, there was a new academic sociology that raced for it. They said, okay, this is what we need for linguistics. We need to have big data science, lots and lots of data network, everybody working on it, everybody sharing tools. Since that time, uh, neuroscience and um, other sorts of things, epidemiology, labor <laughs> economics have moved in the big data science uh, direction. Well, that was 2000, so that was the conception of this idea. It gestated for 10 years until 2010. I was at UC San Diego on a grant, uh, living in Del Mar with my family, and we went up to the Los Angeles Times Book Fair. My wife is a writer, and there we met Francis Stein, a professor at UCLA, uh, who's an old family friend. He knows my all of our children very well. And I was on his dissertation committee. Um, and uh, so after conversations with the family about quantum mechanics and the philosophy of this and that and politics and so on, uh, Francis uh, wanted to show my sons this new computer room where, because there was biometric security, he had to put his hand on a certain panel in order to be admitted. And then you went in and there, all these rack servers and cold temperatures. And I learned that he had taken over a, 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 a digital recording um, device at UCLA. And uh, I thought, wow, there's an awful lot of data here. This is recording people communicating. And he said, yeah. So we started working on it. And that night was the birth of this lab, right? Now, it did not get its first products until 2012 and did not get its name until 2012 uh, at a we were at a conference at the university of british columbia um, and we were going to present this uh, new big data science lab that we were putting together and i had realized that it's an unusual sort of lab it's distributed all over the world and it has a very unusual academic sociology, one in which everybody's essentially like me. Everybody, it's a cooperative. Everybody works, everybody builds things, everybody contributes, everybody puts stuff in. And the people who get the benefit of everybody else's tools and equipment are the people who are contributing. I said, we ought to call it the Little Red Hen Lab, which is a, a reference to a folk tale about the Little Red Hen who uh, asks every, it's the first Donald Duck cartoon, by the way, it's, although it's called The Wise Little Hen. You can see these all at redhendlab.org. And uh, she asks everybody in the barnyard, who will help? And of course, nobody wants to help, right? Donald Duck says, <laughs> right? So not going to work. And so she goes all through all of the steps, and finally she's got the bread. Uh, who wants to eat the bread? And of course, you know, the pigs and the cat, everybody wants to eat the bread. She says, no, it, it's just for me and my chicks, right? So sort of idea is there's no staff. There wasn't any funding really, although we had a lot of support. So we called it Little Red Hen Lab. It was a joke uh, and, it, uh, and it stuck. So the Little Red Hen Lab is an attempt to uh, make big data science for multimodal communication. And fast forward, Red Hen now has data in almost anything. Lots and lots of texts, Roman portraiture, sculpture, medieval paintings with representations of co-speech gestures, runes, uh, Scandinavian runes, anything you can record 
by any means where human beings are engaging in communication is something that we can put into uh, Red Hen. We publish articles. Uh, you can get these on our website, redhenlab.org. Uh, toward an infrastructure for data-driven multimodal communication research, lots of authors, including people from engineering here at, uh, at Case. Uh, it goes through the design of this lab and uh, how to include all these sorts of things. We uh, here, for example, is an article that got the cover of the German uh, Journal of Artificial Intelligence on how Red Hen Lab works. We run conferences. So here's a conference that will be happening in May um, 2020 in Germany. This will be the fourth conference that I have organized and funded in four years. So I'm getting a little tired of it. And that's time, I think, for another Red Hen to come and run a conference. At these conferences, we run workshops where we train people in the workflow and the tools and techniques of Red Hen Lab, which I'll mention to you. Uh, we're going to do this one 7 May. At right before the conference. And then uh, about a week later, we're going to run a couple of days of workshops in Zagreb. We have a major Red Hin Lab unit in, uh, in Zagreb, Croatia. Uh, so we run these sorts of uh, uh, workshops. We've been funded, we have a lot of funding now. Uh, most of it comes from Germany and China, but also, we've had funding from the NSF and so on. Google has funded us for four years. Uh, we have had five years of Google Summer of Code, which includes last year, 19 people paid by Google to do open source coding for uh, Red Hin Lab. We also run a, um, a uh, learning environment where we provide tutorials in many kinds of uh, computational, statistical, and technical tools for the analysis of multimodal communication, including lots of software that uh, Red Hen has developed itself, right? Um, anybody who wants access to Red Hen goes to redhenlab.org and uh, submits two proposals. They can be fairly brief. One is a research proposal and the other is a contribution proposal. And this goes to uh, a special email, access at redhinlab.org. And this is interesting because the reason we do this is for the lawyers. Um, we have to have a lot of data of lots of sorts. And the reason for that is that if you want to build tools in data science, then you have to have a lot of data. The phrase is, if machine learning is the rocket, then data are the, are, are the fuel. And all around the world, we get tons of people who work in data science and machine learning. Well, I mean, they're just all over the place. They know how to run TensorFlow and they run, but what they need is our data, right? Gathering data, acquiring data, Coordinating data is an extremely, uh, extremely difficult job. Well, the easiest way to get data actually is to record network news because section 108 of the US Copyright Act says, notwithstanding anything in US copyright, libraries and archives may record audiovisual news to loan for the purpose of research. So red hands, uh, news holdings will never be made available to the public. But if you're a researcher and you would like a loan, well, we can work that out. And the reason you have to send these proposals in is our lawyers, who are the University of California law team, say you have to have uh, a research proposal and a contribution proposal for everybody. You give them access. It's very specific. And this is based on the original constitutional uh, provision that anyone who publishes anything in the United States has to give a copy to the Library of Congress so that uh, it can be loaned free, so that it can be loaned for research. So uh, we, you know, we don't make this available to the public, we don't sell it, 
that, although we can charge fees for service and things like that, but we can share uh, all of this data with anybody who's legitimate and who makes a, a, a contribution proposal. And we do an awful lot of uh, that kind of sharing. Now, the TV network news is uh, easily captured now. When we first started, um, 2010, it took satellite cards and big Linux servers. Now we've got it down to about $200. You can get a little Raspberry Pi and a tuner and plug it in and off you go. We now have um, all this various kinds of data. Something close, in, close to uh, a half a million hours of recorded data in Red Hat. It's live, it's online. I just fire up the terminal and take you to it right now. Five billion words. More important, we ingest about another 120 or 150 hours per day, entirely robotically, involving no human monitoring. We have a dashboard. If something goes wrong, one of the Google Summer of Code students wrote this dashboard for us. It monitors the world. If anything goes wrong, we get a flag. Hey, guys, go and look at this. This is done all automatically, all robotically. Many of the things I might show you today, no human being has touched, no human being has looked at, no human being has organized, managed, coordinated. It's all algorithms. Okay. We now have uh, in this data set, English, German, Norwegian, Swedish, Danish, Dutch, Spanish, French, uh, Italian, Romanian, Russian, Polish, Czech, uh, Croatian, uh, European, Portuguese, Brazilian, Portuguese, Chinese, Mandarin, and from Hunan, uh, Arabic from Cairo and a couple of uh, languages from India, right? And we can just expand like this. The network news is of course one kind of data, but it's ecologically in the valid, valid in the sense that people are watching this all over the world. Two-year-olds and 82-year-olds watch it. They watch it in remote islands in Greece, they watch it in Manhattan. Uh, so you get this massive cultural, real-time uh, communicative system. Now, there are some people in Red Hen who care about the fact that more than half of our holdings are news because they'd like to study the news, right? Uh, that's not me. I study patterns of communication. My interest is the patterns of communication that you can see in these recorded sorts of things. Uh, so I have a big button that says, I don't care what you're saying. I just care how you're saying it. And that means multimodal. Uh, you can see conversations with people. The news has folks who don't know they're being recorded, crowdsource things, interviews in the street, and on and on and on and on. But again, the main reason for me to have that is so that you have the data that are sufficiently rich to let you develop tools that you can then release on anything, including recordings that you made in your lab that are under control of HIPAA. And the question always comes up, well, what about confidential or intellectual property? And that, that's just the right question because uh, those things are constrained. Well, if somebody has the right to see the intellectual property, we just let them do it by setting the permissions accordingly. I'll give you an example. I had a student who wanted to work on paralinguistics, including laughter, because laughter is a form of communication. It occurs all the time in conversation. So you usually won't find it in text. Um, you won't find it uh, uh, recorded in transcripts or stuff like that, but there it is. So how are you going to find it? Well, luckily closed captioning always tags natively uh, the laughter, but you can also use various uh, audio tools in order to pick out, to have the robot pick out laughter, and then you can study it. 
And the student said, yeah, it reminds me of that goofy laughter. Well, I own all of the cartoons, the goofy cartoons, right? And uh, so I just put them in Red Hen. And putting something in Red Hen doesn't mean a special place. I do have a 440 terabyte server, file server right here. Uh, God bless Case HPC, which has made Red Hen in many ways possible. Uh, it is a fabulous team and a fabulous resource to have here at Case Western Reserve University. We footnote and thank them all the time when we publish articles. Um, to be in Red Hen means we can network to it. So there are a lot of networks, network servers that have data and you can just over the net use Red Hen tools to and analyze those sorts of things. So I network the goofy cartoons and let my students see them because I own them. I have the right to see them. Now that's not the same as the right to show them to you here and charge you money and so on, but we can handle intellectual property that way. And we have, you can see on our website, a lot of, uh, we're developing a lot of tools for dealing with data that actually requires strong anonymization, right? How, how do you go through that? This is a big question for us and, and, and we're working on it. So the reason I picked the Goofy cartoons is that they have in Los Angeles, where entertainment is the industry, a phrase, don't mess with the mouse. The mouse is Disney. And mess with is a euphemism. That's not really what they say when they say don't blank <laughs> with the mouse. Because Disney will come after you, regardless of whether there's any money to be made. Um, but we have no problems, and our lawyers are very strong on the need for universities to push this a little so that we avoid a chilling effect. So we can use this stuff for research. It's in Section 108 of the US Copyright Act. And to use it re reasonably for, uh, for fair use. So um, that's the way this goes. Now let me take you behind the scenes just a little. You already know that we have all of these languages and lots and lots of data. So what do we do with it? Well, here we go. Let's go to Zoom here and share my screen and I will share my terminal. Yeah, let's share that. Okay, so a bunch of flat files. There are principles for Red Hen uh, that just come from the history of my work on language and communication. Uh, one is no destruction of data ever. And you know, if you wanna do something to the data, and we often do, you just duplicate it and do it there but we don't destroy the data we've captured. We never hide data behind theory. So I don't want anybody to say, oh, I see why this stuff is tagged this way. It's because Mark Turner loves X. No, theories fade. So you don't get to take the data and do something to it that makes it, as it were, visible only through a certain theoretical lens. Low entry costs. So. These are all flat files. And an undergraduate can look at them and begin to make sense of them in five minutes. We do allow the data to be put into databases uh, for various purposes, that's just fine. But when those databases die and they don't get a manager and they don't get the grant and it all goes pear-shaped and sideways, that's fine. Uh, we built this as a camel that can last through dry seasons. If there's no funding, that's fine. It's all just sitting there, right? Uh, I, in my life, have seen many, many attempts to develop research methods that became a silo and died because the infrastructure needed to make it work had become so elaborate um, and the professors didn't want to run it or didn't know how to run it that we just weren't going to uh, do it that way. It's all open source. It's all Linux based. We don't allow anything that this is the result of proprietary software to go into trunk. You can take something from Red Hen, and if you want to do something with proprietary software to it, fine, but that's a branch. That's a fork, and we just cut that branch off. We're not making anything inside Red Hen. Any core functionality depend upon proprietary software ever. So if 
if you go to, oh, by the way, the Red Hen uh, archive data set, huge thing, is an official archive of the UCLA library and the Case Western Reserve University Library. We're indebted to the library for making that uh, possible. That gives us super good compliance with section 108 of the US Copyright Act. Well, for things that have a broadcast time, uh, we stick them in a day, in a file. So here's your 2020, here's month January, and here's day 16. So all the files for that day, universal time, go into that directory. The deal there is uh, we know the local broadcast times. This is true for something like Twitter. The local broadcast time is when the tweet came out. But we convert that all to universal time. Uh, which is actually quite difficult to do because different countries go on daylight savings time at different times. And you will be surprised to hear that there are regions of the world west of another region that in fact have a, are in a later time zone. But luckily there are algorithms that will convert local broadcast time for any day for any, into universal time. So they're all tagged with universal time. And this is important for, so for instance, if you wanna know is Fox and Friends influencing what the president tweets or does the president's tweets influence Fox and Friends, you wanna know what's happening around the world in real time and the universal time uh, can, can give you that. We're collaborating with the Oxford Internet Institute on building the Red Hen data set for Twitter Right? Okay, so you go to a day, it's easy to do, and uh, you ask what kinds of files are in there. And, and as you see, there they are. Uh, you can do this in uh, many, many different ways. And yeah, so stop that. So I'm gonna go to the next one, yeah. And if you say, okay, I wanna see the broadcast for Jake, Jake Taper. There they are. And you'll notice that a, a given unit in Red Hen has a unique file name. In this case, because it's a broadcast, the, the dates and so on. And it comes in various different forms. You get the MP4, but we are able to crack out the closed captions. And the closed captions are really useful because you can use them with the standard Unix calls, things like grep and sed and awk and so on. And so you can find sort of uh, any pattern, if you know the, uh, if you know the string, um, uh, they look like this, right? So this is a file. It's got a header. It tells you what's going on, uh, when it was recorded, and so on. And you have a beginning timestamp and end timestamp for the individual bits of the closed caption. Uh, and this is all, no human being has ever looked at these files or done anything to these files. This is all produced robotically, automatically, and you can just uh, search for it. Now, there are also transcripts uh, for a lot of these things, which we can just steal from ABC, CBS, NBC, uh, CNN through LexisNexis and so on, again, automatically. Uh, problem, of course, is there are no timestamps, but a PhD was won by someone who figured out how to put the transcripts into registration with the closed captions, which is not easy to do, so that the timestamps from the closed captions, which we know, could be migrated to the transcripts. This is raw transcript without that uh, sort of thing, um, but there you are. Now, then you can have robots tag this, we have many, many different kinds of tagging. So you take the MP4, that is whatever is on screen. And this is anything, it can be a painting. And we use uh, Tesseract from Google to extract the on-screen text. So you know what the audio video was, what the closed captions are, what the transcript was, and what was on screen at a particular time, right? This is in a file, the on-screen text, that has the same file name .ocr. But your search functionality, your browsers, whatever, can pull from any of these files. And the end user looking at this may not have 
any idea what's going on in the background, what file it came from. They're just seeing what's all, they're able to search for all kinds of things. Now, we tag all kinds of tagging. We tag for parts of speech. We tag for natural language, that is grammar, Stanford Core NLP, uh, Open NLP, that goes through and automatically tags the grammar, which means that you can then search it. Um, and when we ran across the memory-based uh, uh, memory based shallow parser, we put that in too. Red Hen is a bazaar, not a cathedral. If there's a way to analyze multimodal communication, put it in, give it a primary tag. If you hate it, fine, filter it out. You don't have to look at it. But one of the things we want to see is where science is disagreeing. This is the genomics model. These people tag the co-speech gestures that way, but those people tag the co-speech gestures that way. They're using this taxonomy, you're using this taxonomy. Great, it's a bazaar. You go in, you don't like what I'm selling, you just go to the next tent or the next table and you buy what they're selling, right? So we, we want the whole world of disagreement to be uh, contained inside Red Hen. And so you'll see like POSO2 here, which is, a kind of uh, grammatical, grammatical tagging. Um, one very unusual thing that we do, which I'll mention, is uh, we tag for frames. That is, if I say the word, if I say I have to call my stockbroker, you know to call up things like buy sell agreement and probably assets. I didn't say any such thing, but you have all kinds of cultural knowledge that not only you know you expect everybody else in the culture to know because it's a kind of prerequisite for being a native speaker of the culture that when I say I bought this book, you get to ask me what I paid for it. I don't get to say, oh, what do you mean paid for it? I have no idea what you're talking about, right? If I didn't pay anything for it, um, then I misled you if I said I bought this book because you know the frame for a buy-sell agreement. So I have to include extra sorts of things in there. Well, FrameNet is a big project and it's computational only in the sense that the frames are machine readable, but Red Hen did the work to set it up so that you can go through the text and tag for frames. So if somebody uses the word may as in a, in a verb phrase, FrameNet will tag that for likelihood because that's an expression that is used to convey uh, likelihood. This means you can search for things grammatically and by frames um, and both. You can do uh, a Boolean kinds of things uh, and there are lots of those sorts of uh, kinds of tagging we can talk about more. Uh, Peter Erig is going to begin in two minutes to uh, tell us quite a bit about a certain kind of tagging. So I want to, yeah, let's stop that. So I now want to share these little images. Share, let's just share my desktop. That's a good idea. Yeah, and we'll come here. So this is an example of a PhD dissertation. This is done by a rising star, someone just about to get her uh, PhD. She'll be speaking at the conference in May 2020. Um, I was at the big conference ICLC in Tokyo and she was elected, we elect one of these every year, uh, to the board, to the governing board uh, for the discipline as the emerging researcher, right? You elect the young one. And it turns out she's, of course, uh, using Red Hint data all over the place. And her uh, dissertation introduces people to Red Hint tools that she's developed in Red Hint. Her dissertation is called Multimodal, Multimodality in Language. Um, she will be speaking remotely in this series at uh, another sort of time. What I want you to imagine. There have been two criticisms, really, uh, about the authorities, I guess. So that will be uh, a question that's raised. But the, could it be clear that we really have an official lead in the information battle with foreign media, media which provide alternative views on world news, views which often run in contrast to the coverage of events by the U.S. mainstream media. We are in an information war, and we are losing. So I want you to understand, uh, I want you to imagine, like, 
almost half a million hours of such recordings that you can access immediately live online and that you can uh, search in all kinds of places. I'm I'll skip over this is the dog and pony show. I usually impress people with all the different languages that we can. Okay, this is an example of searching for frames. I said to Red Hen, hi, I would like to have any kind of report that's about the likelihood of a weather event in a political locale. Named entity recognition knows about political locales. It finds thousands of things. By the way, I once spent six months putting together a database when I was in uh, graduate school. I had about 2,000 examples of a certain linguistic pattern. It was awesome. People were very, very impressed. It was on three by five note cards. I got them from everywhere. I still have the wooden boxes I built for those three by five note cards. In 2012, when I was at the Center for Advanced Study at the Norwegian Academy of Science and Letters, I ran the first big search in Red Hen for exactly the pattern that I looked for. I set it to go. I went to get the glass of wine to go to dinner. Me and my family were about to have dinner, but there was a ding and I went back to the computer. It was done and it had, had, it had found 100,000 examples of the pattern that I had spent six months looking for to get 2,000 when I was at Berkeley, right? Okay, so too often we are Rolls Royces having been used as a wheelbarrow, uh, just having to spend so much time getting data that now is just completely on tap. This means certain questions are tractable that previously weren't. It means that my undergraduate students can actually get data on something in, a, in three days and, and pursue an actual research question, which would have been impossible. Uh, at a previous time. So this is how that works. Um, I was, so what are the, some very simple, uh, just demonstrations of things you can do. I was in China, there was an English linguist. I said, what are you working on? This is a workshop, this is a, a, a talk. What are you working on? He said, oh, I'm working on the fact that, I mean, this is inside ba baseball, only linguists would care about this. You know, you can say I know the fastest two swimmers, but nobody ever says I know the fastest one swimmer. So why not? So he had a characterization of what the grammar is and so on. So I said, well, let's try it. So right there, we did a little jiggery pokery. We're gonna look for some of these phrases. And this is, I want the uh, a superlative adjective or the most, because you can say, hi, he's the quickest or the most quick. I mean, different, different uh, adjectives take the is the superlative form of the adjective or the most uh, singular or plural one, and then any of these kinds of noun phrases, blah blah blah, and just look in a tiny part of Red Hen because after all, it's got five billion words. Okay, and up comes immediately, Congresswoman. What is the most important one issue? Most important thing you want to hear from the? Okay, live real. It's like real time pathology. You have a hypothesis, you say this can't happen, boom. But what are you gonna do? Sit around in the cafe for nine, 90 years, wondering if anybody comes up with an example uh, like this. And of course, in Red Hen, you can actually see the person perform. So if you wanna know what the gestures are, what the prosody is, and you can have auditory tagging and so on. So uh, Thomas Hoffman is working on the X or the wire. That's, you know, the bigger they are, the harder they fall. It's extremely complicated and he's got ideas about scalar differentials and certain kinds of uh, um, prosodic uh, patterns. So he goes searching, he finds this, we find lots and lots of examples. The main component in that huge Santa Ana we had with the dry, warm offshore flow for more than a week is shrinking, weakening, moving to the southeast, allowing the approach of a front. The closer this front gets, the stronger the cool, moist onshore flow. So tomorrow we're going to drop 6 to 10 degrees. The closer this front gets, the stronger the cool, moist onshore flow. Now, we didn't go looking for these words. We went looking for this grammar. You can characterize what an X or Y phrase is. It, 
lots of different patterns and boom, off it goes and back it comes and you can see what's, uh, what's kind of going on. We like, we like to see the errors people make. So um, I'll skip over that because you believe me, uh, I've worked for 40 years on the X is the Y of Z construction. That car is the Mona Lisa of automobiles. Now it has a lot of uh, related patterns. That car is the Mona Lisa where you don't have to mention the Z uh, or the W. Uh, that car is the automobile equivalent of the Mona Lisa. That car is the automotive equivalent of the Mona Lisa. That car is the equivalent of the Mona Lisa. That car is the automotive Mona Lisa. Okay, but now notice there's this thing. When somebody has something they want to say, and there are two different ways to say it, if they overlap in a certain kind of way, you typically, you often get a performance where they conflate the two. People don't even notice, right? This is like someone saying, let me introduce you to my future husband-to-be. Let me introduce you to my future husband-to-be. Right now, oh, does that mean I see you're married to this guy, but you're going to divorce him? And there's that other guy over there who is your future husband to be, right? No, that's not what people think. They think it means my future husband or my husband to be. It just goes together. Okay, well, I thought that if you get this car is the equivalent of the Mona Lisa, and this car is the automotive Mona Lisa, they're so close that the noun phrase in six might just drop into the slot for the noun phrase in five. You might get things like that car is the equivalent of the automotive Mona Lisa. Notice it isn't the equivalent of the automotive Mona Lisa. It is the automotive Mona Lisa, but you might get this. Now, of course, I didn't go looking for Mona Lisa or automobiles. I looked for the grammar in Red Hen, and you immediately get things like this elevated this it set a record and yeah. it elevated this this industry to investor class i mean why go to gold when you can go to cars that's right you know the, that car is the equivalent of the automotive mona lisa um, and, it's uh, one okay. of the finest cars so in the can, world you and can say, a lot of people oh, thought you're that not going to find stuff and then you look in red and you find it and you say well you are going to find you're going to find this pattern I, because that's how grammar works and you and it's very rare you look in red and boom there it is lots lots and lots of examples uh Many things are rare. We don't actually have absolutives in English, but we have quasi-absolutives like absent diplomacy, this will never work. But where are you gonna get examples like that with the kind of prosody? It's easy. You, you go looking in Red Hen and you get tons of examples. Um, Joining me now, Scott Rasmussen, president of RasmussenReports.com and author of The People's Money. Also, Chris Dyerwa, our Fox News digital politics editor and host of Power Play on foxnews.com. All right, guys, thank you both so much for being here. So, Scott. Uh, so, this is my last example before I turn on Peter. You're, I'm sure you're ready, Peter. The, uh, we are all operating at ground here and now, meaning a certain thing to us. And I could characterize that at great length. Uh, but when you move into things that are not in the ground, what do you do in order to communicate? So for instance, in recorded media, where people are in different spots, what do here and now mean, right? It's immensely complicated, right? Uh, so we, you can go looking for it. And in fact, we did. This was 2012, one of the biggest ones. There are five words in Russian that cover the here and now landscape, right? And I was working with a bunch of Russian linguists. They put together, a database, took them three months, awesome postdocs, seven of them funded. They put it together for three months and then we went through and they hand tagged it and they figured out how all these words for here and now were being used in Russian broadcast media, right? Okay. I and Francis did the analysis in English. This is British English, American English, Australian English overnight and had a vastly bigger database better tags, just incredible. So we did the English part, what happens with two words. They did the Russian part and we published it. And this is really awesome because I know exactly five words of Russian, but now I have an article in the principal journal in the world on Russian uh, linguistics. These are just, I'm gonna skip all of this, all of this, all of this, and in fact say uh, that I'm not gonna tell you about this paper with Beta Hump. What I am going to do is, uh, I hope that that has given you just a little bit 
of an idea about the kinds, the ranges of data, the way this works, and uh, the kinds of questions that you can ask. Now, Peter, you're on. Turn on your speaker. There you go. Just say something and let's see if we hear you. Hello, hello. Can you hear me? Wonderful. This is Peter Urig coming us to us from Bavaria. Okay, I'm not sure. Can you see my screen or can you see me at the moment? We see both, but mainly, oh, your, mainly your screen. So this is perfect. Take it away. All right. Well, thanks a lot. Um, um, thanks for having me. I'm going to tell you a bit about the automatic annotation of the data set that Mark describes, um, which I have been doing in the um, process of my postdoctoral thesis, my habilitation, where Mark is on the committee. And I, um, I'm a corpus linguist, so I specialize in making um, data usable for linguistic research. And what I did to the Newscape archive is um, uh, some sort of um, automatic annotation on the textual level. I'm not going to go into great detail here because we're more interested in the multimodal stuff, I think, for today. But um, we did some improvements on the annotations that you saw earlier, where um, because of sentence splitting was really problematic because it's all uppercase. And well, it's hard then to guess where a sentence starts because sentence splitting usually relies on cues such as capitalization. Um, we extracted text that is not spoken. So if it says something like applause in the subtitles, then you don't want to get, uh, you won't find that in the audio. So we removed this and then we did all sorts of standard annotations to it. And the interesting part is the next step, and that is the forced alignment with a piece of software called Gentle. That means we feed the audio and the subtitles, the processed subtitles, to a computer program. And the computer program actually matches those two in the sense that it tries to find each word in the audio file. And then for each word, tells you where in the audio file exactly it can be found. And that helps us then to also run um, or combine it with image annotation. Now, the image annotation was done by um, somebody at CASE. The tool, it was created by uh, a master student called Sergei Turkin, supervised by Jimmy Ray, um, which is very good. The only problem is the guy is gone and works for Google now, and so we can't get hold of him anymore. And I'll show you what these things do in a, in a second. So for the forced alignment, what we get is we get, this is a, a tabular format where in the first column you see um, the words. Um, so faster than a gyrocopter, more powerful than pizza wrap, no idea what that even is, and hitting harder than Holly Holm. And there you get the annotations, part of speech. So, so this is an adjective in uh, the comparative form and you get a lemmatization, which sometimes works and sometimes doesn't. And then you get start time of that word down to the one hundredth of a second, end time of that word. And um, for all the sounds in the word, all the length of the sounds in the word, things like that. And um, the video annotation system, it outputs something like this. Um, well, this is a soft piece of software called Elan that allows video annotation. And what we see here is that the computer says that at this moment in time, that's where the red bar is, um, there is a person on screen. It's the speaker who is on screen, which is basically person on screen detection plus lip movement, and the hands are moving. Okay, and at the moment, the head is not moving. So head moving vertically and head moving horizontally, you see are not happening. That is going to happen further down um, the road. All right. So what can we do with this? Well, first of all, we can actually put it into um, a piece of software called um, CQP Web. And uh, let me just very briefly show you what this does. Um, so for instance, since we're talking about data today, let's just type in the word data. And um, what we get is, this is um, for the linguists, it's straightforward, it's what is called a keyword in context concordance. And um, it means that all the hits of the word data are displayed in their context. So you can quickly take a look at it. 
this piece of software allows everything that you normally get in uh, in this kind of analyzer. So you can um, hover over it and you get the part of speech annotation. You can click on it, you, you get larger contexts, um, like five sentences to the left, five sentences to the right. Um, up here, the text uh, ID will give you information about the file. So this was um, uh, recorded at um, UCLA and it's called CNN Newsroom with Poppy Harlow and um, all sorts of metadata like the resolution, the duration of the file and um, date of the recording and things like that as metadata. Now, that is still relatively straightforward. We just found the text, but we of course want to actually take a look at the video or audio. So um, what we see here is a little addition to that piece of software that I wrote where I can click on this word and it, uh, on this number. And what will happen is a, a little pop-up will turn up with a video and ideally it should have two seconds of audio to the left and two seconds of audio to the right of data. So let's uh, listen to it and tell me if you can hear the audio. Any of our Poorly, but we can see that you can. Sorry? Poorly. We're hearing the audio poorly. Okay. That's... But but we can hear that, you know, you in front of your computer would hear the audio. Yeah, just a second. I'll just see whether I can tell Zoom to actually... Mm -hmm. Yeah, sorry. I need to click. Um, okay, let's try again. That. Uh, yes, it's perfect. about the dumping of the data. You know, everybody hacks each other. The Americans hack. Um, it's about the dumping of the data. And the you get the idea. Yeah, the point is, let me interrupt, Peter. I emphasize this is not canned. This is live tapping out of half a million hours of data. You just click the number, up it comes. Go ahead, Peter. Yeah, okay. Now, of course, you could now, let's say you're interested in the analysis of uh, the pronunciation of um, the word data um, in American English. And I will just briefly show you um, a slide here. Um, according to the Longman Pronunciation Dictionary, um, they do things they call pronunciation preference polls. And according to them, in American English, we have 64% of data, 35% um, of data, and 1% of data. Now, we have not been able to actually find this 1% of data in the data. Um, well, my student who worked on this and looked at 200 of something like, uh, I think 200 examples, um, she found one example where it actually said the word, well, it, she listened to the audio of the snippet and it was data, but when she listened in closely, it was something, or at the context, it was something like Trump's data, Tiffany, which basically <laughs> was a transcription error. Um, so we don't see that, but um, we see data and data, and yeah, let's say you're interested in that. So what we could do is, um, sorry, let me go back to that concordance. Now, we have 13,000 hits. We may not want to annotate 13,000 hits. So we'd thin this query to something manageable, say, for instance, 200 hits. And this will randomize 200 hits out of these um, um, 13,000. And now we can download it. And we have a little button that we added to this piece of software that says download with settings for rapid annotator. The rapid annotator is a piece of software that I originally wrote back in 2016. And then concordance rapid annotator import um, data. Um, it, I wrote it back in 2016 and it was really, really, really user unfriendly. And um, you wouldn't want to show it to people. Um, when, um, that's when the Google Summer of Code of 2018 and 2019 came in very handy. Mark told you about this earlier. 
um, because we were able to hire students to actually re-implement it into something user-friendly. And that is what um, they did. And the result looks like this. So I can go to this homepage of the rapid annotator, say add experiment. So I call this data, whatever type of experiment is a video experiment for today. And I want to import directly from the concordance. I just downloaded. I want to see two seconds before, two seconds after. And then I will just upload the file I, um, I downloaded earlier and then go to add labels because there I can set up what I want to actually have. And what I want to have is here just one annotation level of let's say pronunciation and well, it's our first one and it's going to be our only one and there I can add basically variable levels to it. So you could imagine pronunciation is a variable and we add levels. The terminology here is a bit different. It's called levels and labels, but it uh, doesn't matter all that much. And so we say it's data, um, that's key one, and da, I don't even know. I'm not, I usually write this in IPA, but um, there must be a, um, a good way of doing that. You get the idea. Then we should add something like misaligned. So if the word data doesn't actually turn up because the forced alignment makes about 13% errors. And then we have something like ask supervisor. This is particularly important if you um, do this with student helpers because um, this is a forced choice. So they have to decide at the time of um, annotating this and you want them to be able to continue. So if they're not sure what to do with one example, they should press something like ask and uh, supervise and you can then later look at these examples. Okay, so we have done that. Now what we need to do is we have to add annotators. So I'm going to add myself, my demo account and my other account. And this is where you could basically say, hey, I have three students who want to work on this data set. Let's add their names here and then they will, um, when they log in, they will find under their experiments to annotate, they will find this experiment. So for our purposes here, let's go there and let's briefly pause. To you who rely on. Um, so what you see here with the user interface is um, the progress bar. We are at zero of 200, of course, and the key bindings. So key one would be data, key two would be data. Um, not, we didn't only put keys here, we also put buttons here if you would like to do with mouse or particularly if you're on a touch device, like an, um, a tablet. And it will now play these two seconds to the left, two seconds to the right forever. Federal climate data, um, so many of them you, who, you, who rely on federal climate data, um, so many. Until you press one of these buttons. And so I'm going to press the. Um, any of them you, who, you, who rely on federal climate data. Uh, um, so many of them. Divers have found the black. And you see immediately the next video snippet starts. It preloads five of them in the background. So it just changes visibility. And um, this allows us to very, very quickly annotate large quantities of these snippets. We get through um, 500 snippets in less than two hours. And that's a huge improvement in efficiency compared to what we used to do earlier. Box data recorder from that. Over decades, there's a lot of empirical data to support to journalism for a long time. But that data journalism is very into what is likely the largest data breach. Ever. Make duplicates of important climate change data. That OK, you get the idea. Once we're done with that, um, you can go back and um, go to um, view results and export results to sheet will download an Excel file and then you can work with that in Excel or in R or whatever you prefer. Um, the same thing can of course be used then for the annotation of gesture and I would just like to briefly show you one example. So this is the, the query for this was the verb chuck. Um, so what we would search for in this is just a second. So this is like chucked it over the fence. So lemma equals chuck. Can you read that actually? Yes. Okay. 
So lemma equals Chuck, and at the same time, this word should be should have a direct object. So we want chucking things actually. So let's chuck it away, or let's chuck it out of the window. So we want a direct object there, and we want a person on screen because we want to look for gestures. And that is the the interesting part now that we can combine all these annotations, textual level and visual level. Uh, person on screen equals five means we have like five levels of confidence here, and five means really I want to be that the computer is really sure there's a person on that screen right during that word, because um, our our Spanish colleagues have actually tried this with um, without the annotation of the video, and it turns out they have to throw away something like 80% of their data because what you see is something like a weather map or an outside view or some head without any sort of hands moving. So we have further criteria we could put here. It's something like hand moving equals five. I'm not doing this at now because actually the hand moving detector is still relatively bad. So when, the, when it says somebody is on the screen, it is as the hands are moving, it's wrong more often than it's right at the moment. Um, so there is things that are, well, sometimes you don't see the hands and sometimes they're there, but they're not actually moving to our human eyes at least. So there's things that don't work out all that well, whereas the person on screen has a good um, precision at least. So if the computer says there's a person on screen, there usually is. So we can do the same thing, get the concordance downloaded, Upload it into the rapid annotator. I've already done that. So, um, oh, sorry. And I just thought I'll show you a few of these because they're quite nice. Imagine a world where the holidays are about joy again. Imagine a world where the holidays are. Okay, there is no word chuck in this example. This is one of the cases where it's just wrong, misaligned. Number seven. Ignore. If you're going to eat a dodo, apparently you just chuck the bones anywhere. <laughs> if you're going to eat a dodo, apparently you just chuck the bones anywhere. <laughs> if you're gonna... So this would be an iconic gesture in this case. So we press one. Give me another one. I'd chug another whole bottle of Mad Dog. That's... Give me another one. Okay, this is not the verb chuck. This is the verb jug. And it's, um, so this is a, an error again, either misaligned or some other problem, number eight. Chucking it at them, like spraying this over the whole crowd, trying to get it into their eyes. Chucking it at them, okay, like no spraying desk, this over. Why don't we just chuck the telescope? Let's do it. Okay, iconic gesture. You take out all the ones that are dead and you chuck them out. Okay, you get the idea. We can again do this sort of gesture annotation and gesture annotation is something that is usually very slow and very time, cons uh, time consuming, very expensive, therefore. And I think we got it sorted to work out quite nicely this way. Okay, for the fully automatic annotation, um, let me just, computer. Yeah, so let's take a closer look at what we can do with fully automatic methods there. So this was the semi-automatic me method where we basically use the computer annotation to look for something and then we do the manual classification. So it speeds up our work, but it's not like um, doing the full analysis. Whereas the full analysis data. would be for this data example, let's for take data. a look at, at um, what the forced alignment system says because the forced alignment system actually makes a difference here between data and da uh, data. And you see that uh, the percentage of these um, is not exactly the 64% that we were talking about. It varies and it seems to be, um, data seems to be uh, on the decline and data seems to be on the rise. If you look at these, this is, uh, is all in Newscape data in the, in the Red Hand data set from 2007 to 2016. And if you put a little linear model in there, we see, hey, it starts around 60% roughly and goes up to about 80% of data. Now, that sounds really convincing. The problem is it's probably an artifact. Um, why is that? The reason behind that is commercials. In 2016, about like some 48 point, I think 7%, let me just, I have the number here somewhere. Um, yeah, 48.7% of the occurrences of the word data are part of a commercial. 
um, even though only like 12.9% of the corpus in as such consists of commercial. So basically everybody uses the word data in there um, and they skew the results greatly. But we can do the same thing for things like either and either where um, the preference poll says 86% either and we see that it's actually more around 75% and we have a slight decline over time from 75 to um, something like 71%. Um, that is something that uh, looks more convincing and can be done fully automatically with this data set. Um, I will just skip over this because Mark doesn't, didn't give me too much time. It's the, about the reduction of don't in things like I don't know. And I reproduced a study there from 1999 where they used 138 examples. And we just decided to um, put in 415,000 examples from 2016 and just see what the computer model does. And it actually does pretty much what um, the other people said it would. Um, so you see, I is the most frequent one in front of don't and so on. Then the following items, no is the most frequent one. And that it, it explains the reduction. So we see that we have very strong reduction for I and for you it's less and, and so on. And investigators, for instance, um, the, the T is dropped much less frequently than it is for the other ones for you know, even for a more frequent noun like people, which was the most frequent common noun. And the similar things for um, initial plosive by following words. So the de in don't is also the length of it depends on the frequency of the following, um, on, of the following um, verb. Um, but in this case, you see we have something that appears off with take. So all the other ones look pretty much in terms of like what their frequency wise, but take is just weird. And again, commercials actually are the problem here. And that is why we're currently working on filtering the commercials. Because if you take a look at this, you'll see don't take Eliquis if you have an artificial half valve. And this is repeated over and over again in this stupid commercial here. This is fatal bleeding. Don't take Eliquis if you have an artificial heart valve or abnormal. And of course, it comes at the beginning of a sentence and imperative. And it's much longer than this is one. fatal. Okay, let's skip a uh, these and take a brief look at fully automatic analysis with video, if that's okay, Mark. Yeah, sure, take a few minutes. I mean, everybody feel free to go, but we're recording this. Go ahead, Peter. I, will, I don't know, what's your time slot? Is it a one hour or 90 minutes a meeting? Well, take another three minutes to do this and then we'll have some questions. Okay, um, so fully automatic analysis with video, basically the idea is to um, calculate the associations um, between words and their gestures of some sort. I call this cross-model color structure. Okay. Yes. Um, if you are... What we find is that we can calculate well, when the computer says the head is moving horizontally only or vertically only and uh, calculate that with interjections. In a statistical model, we can see that actually no is the only one that is attracted by the um, horizontal head movement statistically and things like yeah, okay, and yes are repelled. And um, this was done fully automatically. So just at, when does the word occur together with some sort of head movement of this or that sort that was detected by the computer. Um, so computer vision combined with linguistic analysis here. And it's slightly more complicated for the head moving vertically only um, because, well, this is sorted by odds ratio um, the, which is an effect size measure, whereas um, it's often like um, the original authors of the color structure paper, they sort it by color structural strength. There you would get yes as the most strongly associated one, okay, and yeah as really strongly associated one for the vertical head movement. But also, and that's quite interesting, the word bam is very strongly associated. Now, this is not commercials this time. This is something that um, is basically human nature that if you want to say, bam, you, you're moving, you're accentuating. And that is also the reason why, for instance, no is borderline, um, borderline um, significant here and attracted because no actually is often accentuated. And I'll show you an example here. And of lifestyles enter show business to have to say, no, I won't entertain. To have to say no, and she moves her head. And this is detected as a vertical head movement by the computer. Still, the results are actually quite. Of lifestyles enter show business to have to say no. I won't entertain. Um, 
I think. Um, last outlook is um, what we really would like to find is things that are not directly tied to the words. That is air quotes, for instance. So this is an example from the 2016 presidential campaign. Um, I think that the illness that Hillary has is... Wait, well, uh, why is that in air quotes? Well, Her because... Doctor says she so the illness that Hillary has in air quotes. Now, finding air quotes um, I think is that... something that is not straightforward, but we're now using a, a piece of software called OpenPose that tries to find these, and you see these images. It actually works, but not always. Like bottom right corner, we don't see the elbows in the image, and that is when the computer vision algorithm fails. Yes, yeah, so just to pause, we want you to understand that this is entirely automatic. You can run this on 100,000 hours of stuff. It, it pit does it without any human attention. Go ahead, Peter. Yeah, um, 100,000 hours is a bit ambitious, actually, because it's very com computationally very expensive. I'm currently running it on 30,000 hours, which uh, is the year 2016. And what you basically get is it will detect all these people here and put these, um, put these um, figures over them. And then you could even look at the... This is Russian. I don't speak Russian either, but I work with Russian linguists as well. And um, so maybe this is the nicest example here that's without audio. You see that it does it on a frame by frame basis. So sometimes these faces disappear, sometimes they come back, sometimes the hand has the annotation, sometimes it doesn't. Um, but overall, this is the best we get at the moment, um, this piece of software called OpenPose. And we're trying to make that usable for um, our um, ghost speech gesture research, but it's not like available online for our purposes at the moment. So I think we can say we had great success with digital linguistic methods in speeding up certain types of research with the help of the computer, like semi-automatic methods, including speech and multimodal analysis. And we have shown that fully automatic methods can be used instead of manual measurements and annotations to some extent. If we use a big data approach, that means non-systematic errors should cancel each other out. Manual verification of samples is necessary at the beginning. And with all these commercial issues, double check before reporting always go back to the concordance line or to the video. Thanks a lot. Thank you, Peter. Thank you, Peter. So let's go to gallery view here and see if we have some questions. If you'll stop sharing your screen, uh, Peter. Yeah. I think I have stopped sharing. Is that okay? Let's see. Yeah. I want to see everybody here, not just us. Let's see, gallery view. Let's try that. There we go. Um, and yeah, so the deal is you'll never replace the human researcher. The human researcher is always absolutely invaluable. But uh, Laplace, the mathematician, said that Napier doubled the life of astronomers when he invented logarithms, because now you can add instead of multiplying, much more reliable, much quicker. And we have lots and lots of methods that are meant to be sort of logarithms for people who work on communication. In other words, using the great power of computational, statistical, and technical approaches to make it possible for us to ask questions and analyze them that previously were not available uh, to us to be able to ask. Okay. Uh, Peter, here you are. Um, the I have I have gallery view on this computer, and I see we still have a few folks like Rosanna and Anurban and Peter Yang. And uh, who has a question? Raise your hand electronically if you have a question. Let's see. Yeah, here's a question. So let me see if I can turn you on, right? So I'm going to manage participants, and these are unmuted. Go ahead. Yeah, Elif. Elif, sorry. Thanks. Oh, Elif. Yeah. Yeah. Hello, hello, hello. Hello. Can you hear us? Yeah. Uh. <laughs> Mike, uh, sorry, he thinks I pushed the button accidentally. Um, but I was curious what you thought about in terms of um, 
Do you ever look at any embedding information in terms of some of the other ways of encoding language that sometimes neural networks and stuff like that use? Or is that all too inexact? Oh, no. We, we definitely, as, as I said earlier, Red Hen is a bazaar, not a cathedral. So okay. most of the natural language processing tagging that we do is mainline symbolic programming. It's uh, recognizing these grammatical elements uh, because that's the way natural language processing has always gone. But in our day, we're now starting to see machine learning, uh, semi-supervised or unsupervised, um, tagging for grammar. And that's, that's a forefront. In fact, the, the person I'm working with, with right now is using generative adversarial, adversarial networks in order to learn grammatical tagging. So we're, we, we want anything that anybody is working on. And uh, we haven't put into full pipeline production in Red Hen yet uh, neural network tagging for grammar. Uh, but it's a research topic and we certainly will when it becomes capable. I should also mention that for the last few years, because lots of, lots of uh, broadcasts or just whatever doesn't have closed captions or transcripts. So we've been doing a lot on automatic speech recognition. Uh, this is Baidu's Deep Speech 2 on a paddle paddle platform for Mandarin, for example. Uh, similar things for uh, Arabic. All of these are cutting edge uh, possibilities with, uh, with our Google funding. This is what we work on. Um, if, if you ever find Red Hen saying, no, we're not interested in that line of research, then it stopped being Red Hen. <laughs> Cool. cool. Thank you. Justin, do you have any uh, particular ideas of how you might use embedding and what, what that might be useful for? Yeah, that's a good question. From a linguistic standpoint, off the top of my head, I'm not exactly sure what it would indicate, except that embedding largely indicates the context the word occurs in. Um, and it also, it, in some ways, accounts for synonyms. Um, so, it would just be useful, it seems like, anytime you use parsed data, it would be also useful to have embedding. For example, perhaps, uh, exactly. you know, like glove or something like that um, for a word-based embedding or something. Uh, so, so in the data, we start early, it'd be fun to see, you know, that sort of embedding alongside. It'd be terrific. And I hope you're volunteering because the way this works is people often say, um, so you're, you're pointing at someone in another. Yes, I'm pointing at Micah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay, welcome aboard. We'll make you a red hen. So people <laughs> often ask, well, red hen is doing X, but it would seem that Y is more important. Why aren't you doing it? And the answer is, we're doing X because there's some red hen that wants to do work to do X. And we're not doing Y because we don't have a red hen that wants to do the work to do Y. So um, if this is, this is the, this is the platform of Red Hen. If you have somebody who wants to do embedding, tagging, and put it into production in Red Hen, that's terrific. Bring us those people. Uh, we'll give you access. Off we go. It sounds fantastic. Thank you. Yeah, Peter over <coughs> here. So, um, thank you, Peter. Uh, this is Peter Whitehouse. I'm a neurologist. Um, the, I, to prepare for this, I read the Little Hen story. Um, and to a certain extent, I feel that um, your, your, your process is your goal. I mean, I, I feel this energy around establishing a new way of sharing and collaborating. But the Little Red Hen did uh, want to make bread, and then she had to decide who to share it with. And I'm, it's not so much um, that analogy, rather, in five years, what is the world going to say about all the red hens in terms of what they've contributed to uh, that addresses um, social challenges that have to do with multimedia communication? Uh, I, guess, I guess that's uh, a question to me. Um, I would say that we have lots of people around the world, specifically Anna Wilson uh, at uh, Oxford, who are most interested in the use of multimodal communication to persuade 
masses or to engage uh, with movements and to let people in the world talk to each other on everything from Arab Spring to climate change to relationships with Russia and Ukraine and, and China and so on. So she runs a large Red Hen uh, um, group uh, at Oxford. I'm hoping you're going to get a chance to meet her. Got the meeting set up. Yeah. yeah, and so those are people who, they're not like me, they're not linguists looking for patterns, but once you have the tools for looking at for certain kinds of patterns in place, then you have, okay, well, we would like to know what kinds of uh, panels on the TV they have in Russian television. We capture Russian television and you can analyze those sorts of things. You can analyze the ways in which you get certain kinds of presentations in Arabic and, and so on. So there are a lot of publications on, a, on climate, on imagining our futures. What are we gonna do about climate change? What about Belt and Road? Uh, what's the nature of tariffs? Uh, what's happening to the political structure of the United States? Lots and lots of people who wanna work on those things, who use Red Hen and who publish on those issues and who develop graduate students who write PhDs in exactly those issues. Now I will say that neither on the technical side nor on the linguistic side, or though the people who launched Red Hen, but they're vastly interested in being able to use this as a resource for investigating how the world is holding conversations with itself about what the world will be. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Anybody else? Anybody remotely? It's a wrap. We'll be back in a week for Roger French who will talk about big data science and energy degradation. He will also give a review of the various kinds of programmatic and degree possibilities here at Case Western Reserve University for undergraduate and graduate students who want to be, who want to learn about this stuff, but who also want to be certified and go on in industry or the academy. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. Thanks, Mark. Nice, nice beard, Michael. I think, um, as I was thinking about my question, the notion of being reflective too on your own process. You're going to have a whole data set about your own um, your own collaborative. Um, evolution um, and that by itself I think is also as, as we often say the, the, the biggest change Fred has brought and we're all, we all care about the publications the linguistics the, the science but actually the biggest change I think is a new academic sociology. We use that term several times. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. How, how, how the world, it's just, it's just stealing from what I saw in genomics in uh, 2000. They transformed the way the world community worked on it. I think I said when I attended the first uh, digital humanities 